Lithium prices have halved in the past year. That, according to data from Fast Markets. Why is lithium under pressure? Rodney Hooper is partner at RK Equity. Rodney, welcome back to Kiko. Thanks very much for having me back on. What's the state of the lithium sector, Rodney? Sure, we've uh, we've had a, a tough year this year. Um, certainly on the uh, China spot side. Um, I think it's important to note that um, the gigawatt hours deployed in EVs for the year, we're estimating about 48% year on year growth. I think Adamus is at 50. So whilst EV sales are probably in the low 30s year on year growth, gigawatt hour deployed thanks to um, a substantially larger average uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle battery size means that we've had robust growth. So the, the demand side hasn't been a disappointment. I think what's happened is um, the reality is there was an expectation of subsidies ending and so on. So we saw a substantial amount of inventory build at the cathode and battery cell level. And those have been run down this year and they have effectively brought supply into the markets, but on a, on a, on a, a running production basis, in my opinion, supply demand is very much balanced. It's just, you had a lot of this inventory coming out. Um, and, um, there was a little bit of, of uh, surprise supply as well. Unfortunately, you know, as the old saying goes, high prices cure high prices, and we got to eighty dollars a kilo, and quite a lot of marginal material came out of Africa and, and elsewhere. Um, and it is part of the problem of the boom and bust cycle. I think is you know if you keep having these spikes, some you know marginal material comes out of the woodwork. And, uh, and, you know, there was supply coming from places we didn't expect. Uh, but overall, it, it, you know, you haven't seen a mass oversupply. So the plummet in lithium prices isn't reflective of actual supply demand. It's reflective of, of destocking across the, the of, across the industry and the supply chain. And, and that's, you know, sent China spot market barreling. Um, uh, you know, where where's that going to, and when will that turn? Uh, I've had different conversations with players. You know, we we swap notes. Some are, are more bullish than than others. You know, guys are talking about after the Chinese New Year next year in February. I would say at some point within the next six months. You know, you can't you can only destock once. Um, and we'll see, you know, what happens with new projects. But uh, I think one other thing to note, just as a last thing on, on commenting on, on that first question, is, you know, Albemarle clearly stated in, in their Q3 earnings call that, you know, current prices are not conducive to reinvestment economics. So don't expect people to be plowing money into, into expanding, you know, at these prices. That uh, was uh, the next question that I wanted to ask Rodney. Uh, you know, there's uh, all different sectors of uh, the lithium space. There's the miners. Uh, we've seen just a proliferation of juniors right now. Also, there's a uh, new types of tech that is coming online. Uh, we've got the miners. Uh, we've seen some uh, serious uh, knockdowns in uh, revenues compared to where they were a year ago. That's been no surprise. But uh, what are we seeing in uh, the junior space right now? Um, are we seeing any? Uh, is it rickety uh, just regarding getting um, uh, getting uh, getting more investment? Yeah, so we, we hear that complaint again. You know, I guess it's uh, it's parallel universes. You know, companies that have had drilling success and are in Australia, of course, are under M and A because. Gina Reinhardt and Chris Ellison, you know, have seemed to have piled into everything. So they aren't struggling. They've raised money. Um, but juniors elsewhere in the world, you know, there's talk about the vagaries again of shorting. Um, so I, I know some of the smaller companies are, um, are struggling to raise cash. Thankfully, uh, you know, a few 
of the juniors was smart enough to put you know some money in in the in the bank in the better times. Um, but you know, to be honest, you know we have a lithium school board, and we used to track maybe fifty exploration and development companies, and that's ballooned to two hundred and fifty or something. And I think as total projects, you know, there's even more. And if we are honest, you know, how many of those are actually going to make it and get built? Well, probably ten percent, maybe at best. How about uh, alternate uh, lithium uh, production? So uh, things, say, for instance, like a uh, DLE on your list uh, when you look at there. Just to uh, clarify, uh, direct lithium extraction. Looking at your list there, um, I imagine that uh, some of these more experimental uh, forms of uh, lithium production are probably uh, having a tough time of it, uh, Rodney. But they have great appeal um, from a CO2 footprint and ESG perspective. You know, they... They slide in very nicely into OEM PowerPoint presentations to say, you know, we're going to have 10 lithium in our batteries. But, and it would be good to see these alternate, you know, DLE, also clay, et cetera, you know, come through. The only thing is, and this is the harsh reality, is uh, CapEx per ton for these projects has blown out. So most of them sit between fifty and $70,000 a ton you know, per ton of installed capacity. And as a comparison, you can still build a Chinese converter for about $8,000 a ton or less. So we're talking a meaningful difference. Yes, the Spodumin mine has to be done separately. But that's the number. And then conventional brine is, is, is cheaper. So, you know, again, if you look at some of the feasibility studies and what they need as a lithium price to justify and and generate an acceptable internal rate of return, uh, at the moment we're way underwater on that. So, at a very best case scenario, this current price correction is going to cause a delay, and a worst case scenario. It's going to be a meaningful problem. The only thing is, you know, is Jigger Shaw and the department, the DOE, you know, has a big checkbook. They can write, you know, um, subsidized loans and help assist in building these projects. But at the moment, you know, that's absolutely going to be needed because, because they're going to struggle. And, um, as with all boom and bust, you know, you end up with these unconventional flow sheets where their market caps are substantially below where their capex is for building a project. And then it just makes the funding exercise extremely difficult. Let's uh, go downstream a bit, uh, Rodney. Uh, the other piece that I've seen has been uh, the uh, sodium ion batteries. There's been a uh, series of uh, announcements regarding that. Sodium ion uh, being uh, an alternative for uh, lithium ion, and then it uh, doesn't rely on some of these expensive uh, critical minerals, uh, but there's some disadvantages uh, with uh, sodium ion. Uh, any concerns or anything that you're keeping uh, an eye on uh, regarding substitution with uh, lithium ion there, Rodney? Look, we'll have to see again, you know, you know, lithium iron, you know, batteries are a 30 year overnight success. They had a long history of development and a long history of, of building up gigafactories and, and scaling. Um, and sodium iron is going to need to go through that process. I do have sodium iron in my models, but I know at current lithium prices and at even higher lithium prices, you know, sodium iron is possibly not that competitive uh, and it's gone a little bit off the boil for all of the talk. So it may well get going, but it remains to be seen, you know, what the theoretical energy densities are and what the actual energy densities, you know, are delivered are, are, are going to be. Um, I haven't seen any data back in the trials in some of the small, low-cost EVs. I have no doubt if it is plausible and feasible and economic that China will use sodium iron in uh, energy storage and in the low-cost electric vehicle segment. Um, but, you know, 
there's there's quite a few players we, we chat to that that think it's it's going to have its teething problem to scale, but it is again a China driven technology. So I'm sure they're going to sort of give their best in 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 getting it up and running so that they can avoid the vagaries of you know of other battery metal prices running away from them when they don't have meaningful domestic supply to to you know to mine the other uh, critical mineral that's been under pressure has nickel uh you recently wrote uh, that uh, nickel will however have its day why are you hopeful look i think in terms of um of the cycles so uh look i guess indonesia is a threat but um the, the reality is uh, as much as LFP is picking up, NCM is still going to be a meaningful technology in batteries. The American market, certainly the largest scale, you know, EVs with large battery, battery packs that are heavy are going to need nickel, um, high nickel cathode. I think, you know, the Cybertruck's going to need it, the Semi's going to need it, and then once we eventually evolve into aviation, going the route of um, of electric, they will need very high energy density, high nickel. So we will see it. The debate's going to come down to, you know, what is the, uh, you know, what is the, um, the sort of provenance of the material coming out of um, out of Indonesia. And is that going to pass muster in Europe and the US? And, uh, you know, if it doesn't, then uh, we're likely to see, uh, you know, nickel from other sources, you know, have a, have a rally. So, uh, you know, I, I think that demand is going to pick up. And then it's a question of, of what is the carbon tax? Is it just plain unacceptable given, you know, um, issues with with uh, tailings and so on so you know it we'll have to see you know nickel isn't in a constructive market if the prices are low um and uh and you are going to need you know a certain level of purity of nickel class one nickel rather than than class two or nickel pig iron for the ev market Lastly, uh, Rodney, um, what are some of the key developments uh, that you're uh, watching in uh, the lithium sector? You named at the top, uh, looking at uh, what this uh, surplus unwind uh, is going to be happening and when does that happen? Uh, there's also been uh, some key developments. Um, I guess also, uh, if you could add to that, are there any key sources of supply that you see coming on online over the next 12 months? Look, we know the projects you know that are due to get up and running and, and they always take longer and teething that they do. I mean, again, one has to keep an eye out because I think if Spodgerman, you know, for me, $1,200 a ton is kind of a, a sort of a key price level. If, if lithium keeps falling and Spodgerman goes under that level, in my opinion, on an all-in sustaining cost basis, and then when one looks at the differential between when something is produced versus when it's shipped and working capital requirements, and then you have um, corporate overhead and exploration, we could find ourselves in a position where uh, you know companies are generating negative free cash flow and they're going to come offline. So there is a risk if we go much lower that we're actually going to see um, supply disappearing rather than new projects coming on you know net for net coming online so i think people need to keep an eye on that you know will people put a put their hand in their pocket if a company is losing money i don't know we, we saw it last time so i think we're getting dangerously close to those levels um then the other thing to look out for is you know is there any ev demand destruction with high interest rates or anything else i think as best as we can see, you know, you know, some of the legacy OEMs are suggesting a slowdown in strategy. You know, BYD is not slowing down. It's got lost, lots of low cost offerings and there are other offerings that are being, that are coming out. So I think 
Uh, that is a dangerous game that they are playing the legacy OEMs. Could they lose meaningful market share in rest of world markets if they don't get going? I think yes, they will. And China is exporting aggressively. It's an opportunity for them to, to get a beachhead into a lot of markets. Um, and then the last thing to watch out for is a restocking event. As I said, you, you know, looking at one of the financials released showed, you know, battery cell inventories were dropping. Um, and if demand and sales keep going as they are, then at some point we will have a restocking and, you know, uh, guys have been running lean. The Chinese converters always seem to have a habit of when the market's dropping, they seem to convert and dump. And when it's going on the way up, they have a tendency to hold back material and squeeze on the upside. So it's unfortunate, you know, a lot of people will cheer for higher prices, but unfortunately, if we have another spike or a quick rise, it's going to mean that more DSO and other marginal projects around the world are going to pop up. And then they're always available, even when we go in the bust, you know, those projects have been identified. But I think, um, as one last comment is for me, the canary in the coal mine is DSO. If you can ship, if you can, you can ship direct shipping or at 1%, you know, grade and 99% waste and do that economically, then, you know, the top of the market's never far away. Rodney, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much for having me back. My name is Michael LaCroix. You are watching Kitco Mining.